Hello, we are here for the first time in so long to talk exclusively and explicitly about my thoughts about books that I read, because I read two books this week, and they are both little things, so I thought, I'm going to do, you know, just a, just a two little books review. Um, so you can see here, this one on the left, um has a word in the title that some people don't like hearing. Um, so up front, I'm just going to say that there is no, I don't think, a way for me to review this book without saying this word a lot. Um, so if you don't want to hear that, I have no judgments about that whatsoever. Feel free to click off the video, um, and thank you for giving it a try, but it's going to happen. So be ready for that. Um, but we're going to talk about this one second. We're going to first talk about this. This is Hurricane Season by Kelby Losack. Um, this came out uh, last year, just uh, not quite a year ago. Um, and I have here a nice numbered and signed paperback. This was printed in an edition of 200. Uh, and it, that was the only physical release that it received. It is still around on ebook, so you can read this, but you cannot buy this physical book. Kelby has written a few other things. Um, this is the first of his books that I've read. I found out about this book because I saw him, someone retweet him on Twitter a while back, um, saying that you know he had 20 copies of this book left, and he was like. Eh, any copies that are left tomorrow I'm gonna burn so if you want it this is your last chance I said yep I bought one um, I have had it for a while a few months and I hadn't read it but I did start listening to his podcast he has um, a podcast that he co-hosts with another author J. David Osborne um, called Agitator, that is about um, Japanese extreme cinema, or horror cinema. So, it's kind of a, a wide net, you know. They, they you know, Tetsuo and uh, Ichi the Killer, obvious choices, but they've been doing some, um, and, and like Perfect Blue, I think, was the most recent episode. But they did, like, uh, Bullet Ballet, also Shinji Tsukamoto. Not really a horror movie, but, um, you know, I think it still kind of fits. It is Tsukamoto who made Tetsuo, but, but um, yeah, and that's one of my favorite movies ever made. Um, I just, yeah, I'm, I very, very adore that movie. And, and, that's a, and that's a good show, and they bring on lots of cool guests, like SoundCloud rappers and, and like, other people who you wouldn't necessarily expect. It's a, it's a good show, and I enjoy it. And so that's kind of been how I've familiarized myself with, with Kelby Losack until I read this book. Um, and so this is a tiny little book. It's uh, 78 pages long, but also a lot of it, um, you know, it's, it's short chapters, and so you'll end up with a lot of pages like this where there's, you know, not even that much on the page. You know, when a chapter might be a sentence long. Um, so it's even shorter than 78 pages would lead you to believe you can read this in one sitting easily. I read it in two sittings, but that was more of just because of I snuck it in between I was doing when I was doing a few other things. You could read this in an hour easily. Um, and so uh, this is a story about two men, a unnamed narrator and his friend uh, Marcel. They are living in a trailer in, like, rural-ish Texas, outside of Houston, Gulf area of Texas, uh, like an hour out of, out of town, doing, they do drugs, they sell drugs, they have lots of guns, they're shooting guns out in the desert, um, and as the title would probably indicate, Hurricane is, is coming, Hurricane is, is here. Um, and so they're, they're sort of holed up in, uh, in the trailer, uh, you know, trying to weather the storm. And the, the first chapter, the first, like, thing that happens is, uh, like a cat 
that's caught by the wind just like splats into the window of the trailer and just like screams as it like slowly gets peeled off of the the wall and soars off to its doom this book has like an incredibly brutal sort of nihilism to it um i found a lot of parallels between this book and the book i wrote which um also are about like young people who are doing a lot of drugs and living in some sort of squalor and feeling very sort of like pointless about it I sort of had the narrator in my book feels very outside of the world that he is in he feels very like he doesn't belong there um and he feels like he's better than these people that he's around but he like doesn't know what else to do because like being in this life and doing these things helps him you know turn his himself off and not have to feel anything that's not the way that then the character the narrator in this this book is though he or if it is that way we never hear him think that um this is just a very plain, you know, this is just the way it is. Um, there is also, I must say, there is a supernatural element to the story. The trailer is haunted by Marcel's dead grandmother, who at least they believe that's who it's haunted by. Um, which takes a number of different forms, um, particularly in the, the finale of the book. I'm going to read a little passage from it. The next morning, Marcel sat alone at the dinner table and stared at an empty beer can. He had his hands on the table, palms down on either side of the can. I toasted a Pop-Tart and spread peanut butter on it and took a bite. I said, The fuck are you doing? Tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth. Without breaking focus, Marcel said, Practicing. Practicing what? Moving shit with my mind. I left it alone. The vibe of another person can be exhausting to be around after so long. I climbed back over the couch, over, I climbed over the back of the couch and knocked empty Rillo packets off the cushions, dug around for the remote. I turned on the TV in the room filled with hecklings of a disgruntled studio audience. Even louder, though, was the rapid aluminum clatter on the table. I poked my head up over the couch to see Marcel's right eye twitching, neck showing veins. Couldn't see what the can was doing. I turned the volume down a little. Maury was on. Some dude getting slapped and booed for the truth coming out about fucking his wife's mom. I took another bite of the Pop-Tart. The TV people had blurry mouths and spoke in bleeps. I thought about this one dude we went to high school with who had caught time for chaining his girlfriend to a toilet and beating her half to death. He'd been off his bipolar meds, some shit to do with insurance, and she couldn't eat solids for like a month, but she'd visit him all the time when he was locked up, and then the day he got out, not long before the hurricane hit, he moved back in with her. I wondered if they evacuated with family or stayed behind, like us. I thought about the windows... Oh, so, I'm sorry. I thought about the widows and the loners the folks who had no one to beat up on when they became overwhelmed with their own insecurities. The people on the TV cried and threw chairs. They said, bleep you and bleep her and bleep your mama. Then they ran backstage and cried some more and hugged each other. The can rattled on the table again. The world outside was drowning. And there we were, stuck inside, watching daytime smut, practicing telekinesis with beer cans. That sort of, like, very cold and detached vibe is present throughout all of this story. And there is, like, some horror and some supernatural stuff that's happening, as I mentioned. But it's not particularly, like, uh, like you know, over, ever present in, in, the, in the text. But it's just enough, you know? And I think that the horror from it is more sort of the horror of the situation in life and, and being trapped you know and you're trapped in this place but it's also sort of like you're trapped in life you know you're trapped by your own life and i've felt that way before i'm sure you have too um 
I really enjoyed this book. It it um especially the last ten pages I felt like really kinda tied a really nice little ribbon on the whole thing. Um, I kind of was like, what, where are we going with this? <clears throat> and, like, how are we going to resolve this in a way that's going to feel significant, you know, uh, as I was approaching the end. But they did it. He did it. And um, hats off to you, Mr. Losek. You you did it. Um, I, yeah, if I, I think this is worth seeking out and uh, in ebook form, since that's the only way you can get it. But, uh... I had a good time reading this one. Now this one, Castle Faggot by Derek McCormick. I got this from the library, as you can see. God bless them for having this. Also, I need to return it tomorrow because there are whole other holds on it, and I had to wait a while to get it, actually. Um, you can also see that there's an afterword here by Dennis Cooper and Zach Farley. Zach Farley is uh, an artist. He's best known for giving his name to the series of GIF novels that Dennis Cooper made. Um, so, this is the first Derek McCormick book that I have read. Derek McCormick has been around for a while, though. He's been publishing since the 90s. And it seems like his MO is kind of what this book is. A short, hundred-ish page book, um that is transgressive, usually about, you know, transgressive sexuality, um, queer characters, and, um, I'm very intrigued to read more of his work after this one, because I really liked this book a lot. This book was good, for sure, but I really liked this book. It's kind of extremely odd and hard to summarize but basically in a big picture it is about um castle faggot which is a uh location inside of faggot land which is a theme park for faggots um it was created by uh walt duty i believe let me let me double check that. Yep, Walt Duty uh, created Faggot Land and and Duty Land. It's known as both Faggot Land and Duty Land. Um, so at the beginning of Castle Faggot, we're presented with this, uh, you know, two pages of you know basically like um, advertising bylines, I guess, about Faggot Land. It's almost like we're getting a brochure or something. So let me just read some of them. Welcome. Welcome to Duty Land. Faggot Land is your land. Fun lands for fun. Future lands for futures. Fantastic lands fantastic. Faggot Land is for faggots. Faggot Land. Walt Duty designed Faggot Land for faggots. It looks like Paris, the faggiest city. It looks like Monster, Monster Mart. I'm sorry, my French is atrocious the faggiest part of the city. It is the part for faggots and monsters and faggot monsters. The faggots of faggot, faggot land. Vive la faggot land. It's full of all your favorite of your faggot favorites. Count Choco Log, Boo Brownie, Franken Fudge, and a fuckload of their friends. They're the monster mascots of the breakfast cereals you faggots buy. Uh, Ch Count Choco Log, the king of faggot lands. Count Choco Log. Castle Faggot is his castle. It's a haunted castle. Go through it and get the shit scared out of you. What's so scary? The castle is full of dead faggots. What did they die of? They ate Count Choco Log cereal. Shit. Shit, shit, shit. Shit is the flavor of Faggot Land. There are shitty rides, shitty restaurants, shitty shops. There are restrooms, shitloads of shitty restrooms. There are turds in the toilets, turds in the sink. There are seven turds in this sentence. The Rides of Faggot Land. If you like rides with puerile puns for names, Faggot Land is there for you. There's Castle Faggot, also Count Choco Log's Log Ride, Boo Brownie's Butt Fucking Bumper Cars, Franken Fudge's Faggot Fun Slide. 
The foods of Faggotland. If you like fancy French cuisine, Faggotland's for you. La Moche Merde. I know enough to know that. Faggotland's finest cafe specializes in cuisine made from Count Choco Log cereal, crepes that taste like crap, custard farts, boo brownies, brownery sells brownies, franken fudges, fudgery sells fudge. And the shops of Faggotland, if you like fancy French crap, Faggotland is for you. At Charles Baudeclair's perfume shop, La Fleur de Malomar, you can buy scents that smell like cocoa and shit. Jean Profit de Lorraine's sex shop, you can buy shit flavored condoms and chocolate coated toilet paper. At Stefan Marsh Marshmallarm's bookshop, you can buy shit like books. Your personal guide to Faggotland, you can locate landmarks by referring to this flyer. And then we have our first of many um, places where there you would assume that there's supposed to be a picture, but there's nothing. It's just a big empty box, and you're just left to imagine. It. And so it's got a bunch of different uh, locations, like the Fag Gates and the Place du As, and um, the Toiletries Garden and Sorbum University, and um, of course Castle Faggot. Um, and then it's interesting because you got, you get, then in the rest of the section, lots of, again, places where it, it, the implication is that this is supposed to be a picture, you know, that this is like a flyer or like a brochure or something. Um, and you, you learn a lot about, you know, like, Castle Faggot, which is full of dead faggots who have all committed suicide because that's what faggots do. Faggots all kill themselves. And then Count Choco Log, he hangs his dead faggots from the ceiling. And they all shit themselves because faggots love shitting because they love fucking asses and asses are full of shit. And, um... It's there's not a lot of narrative happening. It's 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 all very sort of like language like that opening I was just reading. You know why do faggots commit suicide? Why not? All the faggots in the castle died because they wanted to be decor. A faggot hangs himself. He is decor. A faggot slits his wrist. He is decor. A faggot shoots himself in the head. He is decor. What do you call a faggot hanging from a chandelier? Crystal. What do you call a faggot with a hole in his head? A vase. Why are there so many ways for faggots to die and so many dead faggots? At Faggotland, they end up doing what they dreamed of, decorating a castle in the faggot kingdom. And so it continues on this way um, for a while until we get to page 27. We get to the Castle Faggot Dollhouse, which is mentioned before um, as part of the merchandising. It's a dollhouse that's a replica of Castle Faggot, um, and then here we get, like, actual breakdowns, you know, what's in the dollhouse, um, how easy is it to shove the, uh, dollhouse up your ass, etc., etc. We, we learn, start learning more about, um, like, the history of Faggotland, and then we learn about the house upside down, which was, um a guy who made illusions named Henry Voltaire and he creates this house upside down that is kind of what it sounds like just a house that's upside down and then you go into it and you're on the ceiling um, and then we uh, get uh, Rue de Do a novelization and this is when it starts getting kind of like more um, narrative, I guess you would say, from this point forward, where here we have uh, an actual kind of like narrative characters, dialogue, people speaking for the rest of the book. And so what it is is it's um, about uh, Derek McCormick, he is the narrator of this rest of this book, um, meeting Count Chocolog in his castle, Castle Faggot, and um, the interactions they have. And so uh, it's like, and it's also like kind of a musical. There's like parodies of If I Only Had a Brain from The Wizard of Oz. Um, Count Chocolog is particularly put out by his rivalry with Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Um, and, and his famous Rankin and Bass animated Christmas special. 
Um, and he also really wants to have a mirror so that he can do his hair, but of course he's a vampire and he has no reflection. And so he's hiring Derek McCormick to create a magical mirror um, to be able to see himself in. The Count sings, I could pick a pot of cocoa, I'd pin it to my coat so I'd have a boutonniere, I would wear a real bow tie and not a bat about to fly if I only had a mirror. The Count's bow tie flies off, it's brown, it's a brown bat. I would quaff my quaff up so high, I'd comb it up to the sky or to the chandelier. I could wear Estée Lauder, put on lots of paint and powder if I only had a mirror. You know, so the Wizard of Oz showing up. Um, we start getting to know the other ma minor characters better. Um, uh, Boo Brownie and Frankenfudge, the other uh, parody serial mascots, as well as uh, certain people, like there's there's a character named after Georges Bataille, um, we also get um, a character whose name is a uh, parody of um, Coco Chanel, but it's Coco, like the chocolate, um, Coco Chanel. And I don't, I, I'm not going to say too much more from here on about what actually happens, because I think it is worth reading for yourself the beginning part is like about experiencing the like de the deconstruction of form and language it's very fascinating but once the narrative actually starts it's the narrative is somewhat is very surreal and kind of hard to follow but i think that's when it starts to be more substantive i think that you really need that beginning part to really kind of like acclimate yourself to the world of the book and it's really fascinating but once the people start talking, that's when things start getting really, really fascinating and good. And then the final section is actually the second section. All the other sections were one thing, because the second part is just called two. Um, and basically it's about, you know, we take the dollhouse and we put it upside down like the, uh, the upside down house. And then the book turns upside down. Um... And I got a little tricked. I was like, oh, am I supposed to go back? You know, because it's upside down. So do I need to flip the book over and then go to the end and then read? No, you want to read it in the same order. You just have to read it right to left uh, for the rest of the book, which is a little confusing. But I did figure it out fairly quickly when things did not make sense. Um, so, but yeah, so that's... And then the rest of the book is told upside down. Um... And this one is also very short, ends at page 84. Um, and then we have an afterword by Dennis Cooper and Zach Farley. And my god, every fucking book should have something like this in it. Where it's just two people. Uh, who uh, Dennis Cooper is, is good friends with Derek McCormick. Zach Farley doesn't know him, but knows his work. And it is just a transcription... 15 pages, not even 10 pages, of um, them having a conversation about the book. Their thoughts about the book, their thoughts about the meanings of the book, the, why they thought it was important, why they thought it was a good book, the things they liked about it, the things that confused them about it. Um, it's like getting to have a conversation at a, like a book club, but, you know, with Dennis Cooper. Genius, to put this at the end of the book. This was, and like, this was one of my, maybe my favorite part of the whole interview. Dennis Cooper says, Derek seems so innocent and sweet, like in person. You've probably never met him, though. Zach says, no, I only know his work. I would love to meet him. Dennis Cooper says, I'm going to tell you a story. One time when he visited L.A., he and Jason McBride and I went to this mall that's right next to the Grauman's Chinese Theater, and suddenly we're walking through the mall... There was the actor who plays Xander on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Zach Farley says, I just rewatched some of Buffy. Xander is the worst. Dennis Cooper, I mean, I mean, I love Xander, but the guy who plays Xander is the worst. Dennis Cooper says, he was walking along with his girlfriend and Derek saw him and went, dot, dot, dot. 
I don't know how to describe it. His face got this demon-possessed look, and he just suddenly jetted away at very high speeds. Xander and his girlfriend were going up this escalator, and Derek zoomed over and stood literally like he put his chest right against their backs, riding up the escalator. I saw Xander turn his head and bulge his eyes out like, what the fuck? And we were like, oh my god. It was this really weird Derek that we had never seen before, who was still innocent, but also really scary. Then we just waited, and eventually Derek came down, and it didn't seem like Xander had hit him, because it was one of those situations where you felt like Xander was probably going to hit him. And then Zach Farley says he probably wanted that, to get hit. Dennis Cooper, maybe, maybe. I would say that's the only time in my experience with Derek where I thought Derek is kind of terrifying. So when I read this book, I thought, this is that Derek coming out. That Derek has suddenly entered the world through his prose. So it wasn't as much of a shock to me as it will be to the usual Derek McCormick reader who will probably read this and think, what happened to Derek McCormick? I know he went through some hard stuff in his life, but this is not the Derek McCormick that I am used to at all. They'll probably be pretty freaked out. I love that. And, like, there's there's so many interesting things that they say in here. Like, just a couple paragraphs later, they're like, there's all of this extraneous language, but it still all really needs to be there. The prose doesn't just describe the castle. It is also architecture. Dennis Cooper, it does everything it's doing in three dimensions. It is so hard to describe. Oh, it's just like, you hear someone say that and you're like, fuck! God damn it, you're so smart. Like, why are you so smart and I'm so dumb? And then there's, like, a part where they're, like, saying how, like, it's funny that there's so much French stuff in it because, um, Cooper says he doesn't think that, that Derek McCormick has ever been to France and Cooper, of course, lives in France now. He's like, I'm always trying to get him to come to France and visit me, but he won't do it. Which is really funny, um, after reading this book. And then they're saying, um... It's like a children's book, or whatever. All of Derek's books are like children's books. And Zach says, wow, it is a children's book. It really is. The best children's book ever written. Dennis Cooper, it's actually, weirdly, the most like a children's book out of all of his novels. Farley, and they all kind of try to be, in a sense, but this might be the most successful as a children's book. Cooper, and at the same time, it's rated X. Farley, I think you would need to get a really cool librarian to recommend it, or some famous TV personality kids look up to, if those still exist, or, you know, kids on YouTube that do reviews of toys and stuff. There must be a kid on YouTube who reviews books, maybe, or he should just get the ones who reviews the toys to review the book purely as an object, which I feel would work, just describing the book how it functions as an object. And then Dennis Cooper makes this de declarative statement it is really just one of the best books ever and maybe the greatest novel ever written so saith dennis cooper this book fucking rocked i need to buy one because i had this is a library copy i need to buy a copy of this because i i need to read this again not like immediately but you know i'm gonna want to revisit this book it it just totally was mind-bending and brilliant and so enjoyable. I had such a good time reading it. Um, so yeah, that I read those two books. I read books. Books have been read, and I and I've been reading audiobook um, too. But I'm not gonna do a review for that one. I might do a video once I read the whole series. Um, but uh, but yeah, so reading is happening. Um, Thanks for watching, as always, and have a good day.